Purple Book, which is every nation's foundational Bible study, over way over a million copies in print. He's a giant, but you know, I've known Stephen all these years. He's the same guy that he's always was. His message is the same, and I appreciate his, he's the real deal. I know him and his family, and we're just so honored to call him a friend here with MFI. The Canastraces and MFI, we love the Merles. Pastor Steve, come on up and take the mic. We welcome you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, David. Thanks. All right. Thank you. And it is an honor to be here. Thank you. And I do want to say, David, in front of all these people, while I have you here, thank you for the way that your church, the church you lead in San Jose, when we were living on missionary support for decades, your church was extremely generous, not only supporting financially, but supporting us as a family. And uh, I really want to say thank you. When we would make our annual trek from the Philippines to the United States, our first stop was always San Jose. And we would stay in your uncle's home and your church would take care of us. And going to those Saturday morning prayer meetings, half asleep, jet lagged, but knowing that that's what missionary support really is. It's not just the money, although the money was appreciated, but it was the support. So David, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I want to say I, I really appreciate um, the honor to be here. Frank is a friend, and I think Frank is not in this room, but I think he's listening on, um, through whatever system he's listening on. So Frank, wherever you are, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for how you live. Thank you for how you minister. And I'm really grateful for your friendship and partnership. And I was talking with Mark earlier uh, I've been sitting in the back taking in the conference and I was talking to Mark earlier during a break and right when I got here about the impact that MFI, at least in the circles I travel in, I get to minister in Japan regularly in about three weeks I'll be in Cambodia and those two nations, uh, the most influential uh, thing happening in the church at large is because of what goes on right here. And the footprint and the impact you've had, you're literally... Um, decades of faithful ministry. Those are the two nations I'm connected with. You have many others, but you're really discipling nations, and I honor you for that, and I, I recognize the work that um, goes out of this place in your school, in your church. I don't just mean this physical place, but this, this movement, and it really is having a global impact, and I, I honor you for that, and I, I really appreciate what you do. Okay. This conference theme is uh, Now Church, <clears throat> and I'm going to try to be faithful to that, but I do, in order to talk about now, I want to talk for a little bit about then. I want to go back to then and then now. And when we think of church, we often think about our church experience. When we think about the church that's gathered together for worship, and that's extremely important, and it's getting kind of pushed to the side in many circles today. But my church experience of being gathered, I grew up in an Episcopal church, and it was filled with mystery, reverence, repetition, and I look back on that as a young boy, and I am grateful for that. I am grateful for a sense of awe and a sense of reverence and the mystery that goes with the preeminence and that goes with the whole, the whole transcendence of that experience. In high school, I came to Christ at First Presbyterian Church, which was similar but not quite as mysterious or rep as repetitious as the Episcopal Church. And I clearly heard the gospel, First Presbyterian Church in Jackson, Mississippi, as a 16-year-old high school student and gave my life to Christ. Within six months, I wandered into a charismatic church, um, and I experienced worship that was not transcendent, but imminent. And I experienced not only the fear of God, which was very important in the Presbyterian and Episcopal context, but the love of God and the experience of God and the, and the presence of God right there. I look at my church gathering experience, and I'm grateful for it. 
<clears throat> last Sunday, I was at my home church in Nashville after living in the Philippines for 24 years. For the last 10 years, my wife and I split time. I'm on my way to Manila tomorrow. I get on a plane tomorrow morning to fly to Manila. And we split time. So I have two home churches, one in Manila, one in Nashville. And last Sunday, I worshiped in a and a celebration service, like always in Nashville. It's a large church, but what's unique about it, and I'll talk more about it tonight, it's, it's multi-ethnic in a very uh, mono-ethnic city. And our senior pastor is African-American, and about 60% of the church is African-American, and I'm a, I'm a white minority in a church in Tennessee. And it's a multi-ethnic celebration. And our worship leader will just shift right into Spanish mid-song. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not like the Episcopal Church or the Presbyterian Church or the Charismatic Church, but wow, what a celebration. And then next Sunday I'll be in a Filipino church in Metro Manila. So I have a variety of church-gathered experience. And if the Episcopal Church was all about transcendence, the Charismatic Church is about eminence. I want to look at Scripture and our text we're going to park in today is very familiar to all of you. It's in Romans 12.1. And I want to walk through this slowly and see what the church then can tell us about the church now in terms of the church gathered. Tonight, we're going to talk about the church going, but this is about when the church gathers. Verse, verse 1, Romans 12. I'm in the ESV. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And I want to zero in on that phrase, spiritual worship. Like Paul does in most of his letters, before he ever tells us what to do or how to live, he always tells us how to think and what, what to believe. So Romans 1 through 11 is all about right thinking, right believing, right doctrine. And then this word, I urge you, therefore, because of all of this, because of chapters 1 through 11, because of right doctrine, right thinking, right believing, therefore, here's how you're supposed to live. Paul never goes to the live right until he teaches the believe right and the think right. Right doctrine produces right lifestyle. If we think we're going to get the right Christian lifestyle without good theology and good doctrine and good word, we're mistaken. So he says, therefore, because of this 11 chapters of unfolding the gospel. He talks about sin, wrath, the righteous judgment of God, the law, faith, righteousness, justification, the peace of God, the promise of God. Then he goes through, illustrates in the life of Adam and Abraham and Sarah. Then he talks about Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God's love and God's sovereignty, Israel's role, the grafting in of the Gentiles. That's all chapters 1 through 11. Therefore, because of all this stuff God did, Here's what you are supposed to do. This Christian life is responding to what God did for us. It's not God responding to us. We do things and then God likes us or loves us or blesses us or whatever. No, it's we watch what he did and we respond appropriately. So he says, therefore, give your bodies living sacrifices. This is spiritual worship. What is spiritual worship? The response to the gospel is spiritual worship. The response to what God did is spiritual worship. But what is it? What does this phrase mean, spiritual worship? The idea of worship in that day, you're in a Roman world now. Worship in the Roman context had to do with many, many gods and idols. None were all powerful. None were omnipresent. They weren't anything like the God we worship. There were many gods. There were idols. Worship also meant emperor worship. But if you weren't just a pagan Roman and you were Jewish, worship meant temple, synagogue, rituals that rolled out from the Old Testament. But if you were a believer, who most of them at this moment were Jewish in their background and Roman in their context they lived in, <clears throat> 
then their worship had to do, if they were really believers, had to do sometimes temple, sometimes synagogue, but increasingly in the home. That was what worship was to them. So in this context of worship, he's saying, here's spiritual worship. Now the King James, and I think the New American Standard translated, here's your reasonable service. And it just tells us that word service and worship are very closely tied together. Most of the translations go with worship, some go with service. A couple go with reasonable, most go with spiritual. I'm certainly no New Testament Greek scholar, but I can read various translations. You can too. Highly recommend it if you're a pastor. Um, What is spiritual worship? According to this text, spiritual worship, first of all, is plural, not singular. I appeal to you brothers. He wasn't, it wasn't an individual thing. Westerners, especially Americans, and especially Americans who live farther and farther west, that would be us right here, tend to personalize and, and individualize things that the Bible sets in community and sets in, in, in more of a plural context. Spiritual worship is something we do together. Spiritual worship happens in community, not you by yourself in your closet. I appreciate closet time by yourself, but that's not what this is talking about. Most of church history, The majority of worship music, the majority of liturgical music throughout church history until the last 40 years. There's been a shift in my generation. But for most of 2,000 years of church history, the majority, not all, but the majority of worship music was us and we, not I and me. But it has shifted right before our eyes and it's no longer communal it's individual and by the way most prayers in the New Testament were we and us our Father in heaven it was corporate prayer primarily but we've individualized what should be done in community other trends in modern worship we're talking about now church gathered the gathered church the going church will be tonight but the gathered church the modern trend in modern worship is singular pronouns instead of plural pronouns and that is a shift in our generation because in corporate worship we now prefer we and I instead of us we give a nod to community but we don't really you know, another thing that's in modern worship is most singing now is about, is to God. It's directed to God. Throughout most of liturgical music history, songs have been about God, primarily, not exclusively, but now they're to God. And it gets back to that. This is me individually relating to God. What worship throughout most of church history was in the music side of worship was that the community of faith gathered together to proclaim together the greatness of God. Now we gather together as individuals pursuing personal intimacy. And there's a big difference in church now and church then. It's not all right or wrong, it's just different. And that leads to the idea now and I'm not making conclusions for you. I'm just throwing the ideas out here. So get mad at the ideas, not me. That leads to the, the how do I say it? The intimacy slash holiness um, continuum or the presence and transcendence. Personal intimacy with God has replaced 
replaced is a strong word, is kind of nudging toward the holiness of God as a central theme of modern worship. The transcendent holiness of God for most of church history was the focal point. That has shifted in our generation. I'm not saying it's all a bad shift, but I'm saying when thing, when the pendulum swings and it swings way over here, there comes a point where it's got to get back to a sane middle place. Now, all right, let me move on. Spiritual worship, what is it? First of all, it's plural. It's communal. It's not singular. Secondly, this phrase, it says, present your body. Spiritual worship is a presentation. It is active, not passive. Presenting is an active word. It's something we do, not something we passively experience. Spiritual worship is something we do. Thirdly, he says, present your bodies. Spiritual worship is physical, not just mystical. That sounds like an odd thing to say. Spiritual worship is physical. What we do with the body goes up to God as spiritual worship. Standing, bowing, dancing, singing, raising hands, lying prostrate. It's what we do with the body. And that was an odd idea because in those days, there was this idea that the physical body was evil, but the mystical spiritual was good. And then Paul steps in and says, no, you present your body and God sees what you do in the body as righteous and holy and acceptable worship. Physical. Now, when I say physical, there are a lot of different kinds of expressions. Now, I was recently, or recently, yeah, in England, in an Anglican church building, a Gothic cathedral, experiencing worship that was quite a bit different than the way we do it here. But I found God in that. Uh, I get to go fairly regularly to Lagos, Nigeria, with my good friend Sam I Dogbone, and it's a huge church, and it's a long church and you don't dare try to get them to stop singing they don't know how to stop there's a fear of quitting <laughs> but wow physical whether it is silently bowing that's physically presenting our bodies to God or whether that's the Nigerian style of not silently bowing <laughs> they're both acceptable to God but it's what we do physically that turns into worship in the context of an, of an idea that physical was bad. Next it says, present your body as a living sacrifice. Spiritual worship is sacrificial, not comfortable. As we approached worship Sunday morning last week in Nashville, as we drove up to church for the 11 o'clock service, my wife commented and she said, wow, the parking lot is full today. Compared to last Sunday, it was empty because it was raining really hard. Wow. Spiritual worship. There's some sacrifice involved. Not that driving your car in the rain is sacrificial, but apparently to some people that's too much of a sacrifice. <laughs> Getting my new shoes wet as I walk under an umbrella into... Anyway. Not here though. Of course, it rains every day here, doesn't it? We're not used to that in Nashville. It's a hardship. Finally, it says, holy and acceptable to God. Spiritual worship is Godward. Spiritual worship is to God. It's for God. It's directed at God. Ultimately, worship is about God, not my experience of God. There's a theological reason we need to worship. And that theological reason is simply this. God is worthy. There's also secondarily an anthropological reason 
And that is, I need to worship. Thirdly, there's a missiological reason to worship. Remember Paul in prison worshiping? The guards heard it. People are listening. There's a missiological aspect to worship that if we get, and I am not, listen, what I'm about to say, I don't interpret this as I am this anti-seeker sensitive thing. I'm not. But we can so scrub worship down to a pop concert that we lose the missiological aspect of worship. I don't, I'm going to discipline myself and go back. Now, when I think about church now and the gathered church, when we come together to worship, it's helped me to try to think in terms of, and you may be familiar, you may not with this, of Soren Kierkegaard's theater of worship. Kierkegaard was a, was a Danish philosopher, theologian. He's dead. <laughs> Although that hairstyle is coming back. And, he, and here's, here's the framework when he talked and wrote about worship. He used this theater as a metaphor for worship, and he said there's a stage, there are performers. Don't get hung up on the word performer, but in the context is a metaphor. There's a stage, there are performers, there's a director, and there's an audience, right? And so what he said was, in modern worship, usually we have a real stage like this. That's where it happens. Here's the stage just like the theater in New York. There's a stage. And he said that the performers are the preachers, the singers, maybe it's a choir, maybe it's a band, but it's the people who step onto the stage and perform. And again, perform is not a ne necessarily a negative word. And Kierkegaard said there was a director and Sometimes that's the pastor, the senior pastor. Sometimes in large mega churches, there might even be a stage manager. There might be, in my world, we call them the pastoral services coordinator. There, you know, whatever you do, there's somebody that's directing traffic. And then there's an audience that's watching the theater performance or in the church context. And so Kierkegaard kind of explained worship that way. But he took it a step further and sort of pushed that aside and said, that's really how we think of it, but that's not how we should think about it. And so what he said was this, the stage is not just this in Kierkegaard's view of worship. He said, let's forget this as the, let's draw a circle around the whole building. And that's the stage of worship. Then he said, the performers, it's the whole congregation. Even those back in kids' ministry serving. Even those people out there serving. Not the one doing Facebook over there, but the ones out there <laughs> serving to make this all, this experience happen. Of course, Kierkegaard said that the director is the Holy Spirit. But here's what it all leads to. In the, kind of the modern view of it, the audience it's the people out there watching the performance here and grading the songs or grading the how the people were dressed and did they have enough holes in their jeans or something or or were they in the sermon and, and all, but he said Kierkegaard said no 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 the audience is God of everything that happens in this circle we just drew around this building the audience is God, and it's not the people out there watching what goes on here. That's not what worship is. It's, it's God up there watching what every one of us are doing. And so here's the problem. We think of worship as the music. Have you ever heard had, had someone say, yeah, I, I came to church late, I missed most of the worship, but I got there in time for the sermon. We're not thinking right. We're not thinking biblically about worship. Worship is everything that happens from the moment you get to that worship experience. The way you relate to one another. And I think as preachers, some of you are preachers here, if we will begin to see the sermon as part of worship, not the singing, as, actually the singing is worship, but even some of us go, no, no, that's not even all. The slow songs are worship, the others are praise, so that's not even worship. 
we, we don't understand what worship is. At least according to this text. It's this presenting your body as this living sacrifice to God. That's spiritual worship. And we take Kierkegaard's idea and say, worship is everything from the moment. This isn't a Sunday worship service. This is a seminar. This is a conference. I understand that. We walk into the time of corporate worship. We're walking in not as the audience, but as the performers. It changes the way we judge songs. It changes the way we listen to a sermon. It changes the way all the stuff that goes in our head, if we will say worship is from the moment I get out of that car and I am walking in, the way that I greet that person is worship to God. And the way I participate, whether I like the beat of that song and whether I like the way, and the way that person looks and all of the style issues, I need to find God in this moment. And then worship is, if I'm the preacher, I am not preaching to you. I am preaching to him, to please him, not to please you. It matters very little if the people listening are pleased as long as God is pleased. Preaching not to impress, but preaching to honor the real audience. That's if you're the preacher. If you're the one out there listening to the preaching, how do I do that as worship to God? What I'm trying to do is hear a word from God through the voice of that donkey. I come into it. I'm here to worship. And part of worship is hearing God. And I've got to hear his voice. And if I see preaching as worship, then I'm walking up here not with a sermon, but with a word from God. And I dare not step up here without a word from God. Changes the way we do it. I was with a pastor recently of a large church, and I was preaching for him. And we were in his office before the first service, and I could hear the music playing, and I stood up to go. And he goes, wait, 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 he had a few more questions, and we were talking. I said, no. And it was obvious he wasn't going to go and participate in the singing part of the worship. But I did anyway. And then the second service rolled around and we were back talking and I heard the music and I said, I, I basically said, I'm going to participate in this whole worship service. We can talk over lunch. And he had a lot of good questions for me. We talked about that over lunch. And he started texting me the next few weeks going, I was there early, I stayed the whole time. <laughs> It was, but seeing, how do we see worship? Now, I want to maybe close with this thought, and then I'll go back to the text. I read an interesting book recently. It's not a Christian book. It's a, it's a book that, um, that one of my sons recommended I read a few years ago. It's a fascinating book. The book's called The Gothic Enterprise by Robert Scott. And uh, it's about the restoration of Salisbury Cathedral in England. I think I have a picture of Salisbury Cathedral on the screen. Can you put that up there? There you go. Um, this beautiful facility is over 800 years old. And uh, it's a classic example of Gothic architecture. Um, many of the Gothic cathedrals built on that same time period are similar to this. But Gothic architecture was obsessed with light and height. Okay, next time you go in a Gothic cathedral, I dare you to not look up. You can't do it. The architectural design forces you to look up. It was worship architecture. You have to. And these people, we're talking 800 to 1200 years ago. What they did with lights cannot be touched by the most expensive light rigs with the best lighting engineers alive today. They can't touch what these people did with how they use light and color. Interesting that people call it the dark ages. The most obsessed part of, of history, most obsessed with light of any other time and what they did with light. But Gothic architecture was obsessed with height and light, but there was a third obsession, and I want to talk about it for a moment. It was art. 
And these Gothic cathedrals from the time period are art museums. I was, uh, my wife and I were ministering in our church plant in Madrid, Spain, and we had a day off and went to Toledo, uh, which was, I, I could have spent the whole day in this cathedral, I mean, a thousand year old cathedral, but it's an art museum. It, it, absolutely stunning. But here's what's interesting. In Scott's book, The Gothic Enterprise, he writes about a restoration that took place a couple of decades ago of this cathedral. And he writes particularly about one of the people named Jenny Jacobs who was working on the restoration. And she discovered, during some cleaning and restoration projects, she discovered intricate carvings, beautiful paintings, in parts of the cathedral that no one had ever seen. Here's what she discovered. Look at that center picture on the top of the spear. There's some of the most beautiful carvings in the whole building. The statues, the 12 apostles, I don't think they're in these photos, but that line, they're like 12 feet tall, the apostles around it. They found out that all of these, all these sculptures are back carved. What, what it means is they're flush against the back wall, but the backs, the intricate detail of the hair and the folds and the robes, it's just as much as the front and no one would ever see it. The top of the roof, the back side of roof tiles have some of the most beautiful paintings in the whole building. And they're put down like that. In the attic spaces, they found carvings and paintings that are as beautiful as any that's out for display. The mentality of the architects and the artists that for over 200 years built this place, and this is pretty typical, it's not just this one. Everything they did was worship to God. They didn't do it to be seen. Some of it was obviously to be seen. But they put just as much effort and work and time into what no human was ever going to congratulate them for. No one was ever supposed to notice why, because it was done unto God. It was done for him, to him, for his honor, for his glory. Why? Because of the gospel, therefore present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Everything you do is spiritual worship to him. What do you think about doing stuff that no one will ever recognize you for? What do you think about your pastors in ministry doing things that no one will ever notice? No one will ever recognize it. No one will ever clap or post an Instagram story about it. That's what worship is. And these people who built these things saw, I think, the application of Romans 12.1. They did it for God. When we talk about the church gathering, the whole thing is worship. We come and we do it together. We do it wholeheartedly. We do it under him. We, it's not about the style. It's not about the dress code. It's not about the music style. It's not about any of that. It's coming before him. And I think what these stonemasons and artists and all these people did is what Paul was talking about, Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore. Therefore, what do you mean? Because of chapters 1 through 11, this glorious gospel. Therefore, by the mercy of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about it. Acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship, spiritual worship. Tonight we'll talk about, after we gather in worship, what does it look like to go? We gather in worship, it's all about him, and it's all unto him. Lord, thank you for the privilege, the honor of presenting our, our broken, frail bodies as sacrifices of worship to you. It's a privilege, it's an honor. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, come on, can we just thank Pastor Steve for that word? That was amazing. Beautiful. Come on, if there's anything the MFI is, it's a worshiping people.